Hello, we are back uh, on time. Uh, we are back on the main stage. Uh, and uh, so we will start uh, with um, uh, digital transformation in EPI lifecycle management, right? That will add to the topic of the main stage. And for this one, the first speaker will talk about EPI success, uh, running a successful API program. And he's someone who knows really well about it because he's the CTO of uh, a major uh, uh, API management vendor and software vendor, Tipco. So and as CTO of Tipco, he probably has learned a lot of things amongst the, the, the big customers he work with every day. And uh, he's also the author of API Success, The Journey to Digital Transformation. So that's also a lot of good, good insight we can have from him. Uh, I will ask you please to uh, personally and warmly welcome uh, Nelson uh, Petrasek that will join us uh, on stage. So uh, Nelson, if you can uh, uh, join. Yes, I see you. I'll invite you on, on the panel. It's like a real stage, right? People have to walk on stage, right? So it's the same thing. Hi, Nelson. How are you? Yeah, we, we don't hear your sound. Uh, are you muted, maybe? No. Maybe if you are still in the Zoom backstage, sometimes Zooms take over the microphone, you know, these video conference apps, uh, like fight for uh, the camera or they fight for, with each other for the, the microphone access. So sometimes, uh, yeah. All right, let's try it. Can you yeah. hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Not yeah it, it thinks I have four different microphones and it always <laughs> picks the wrong one to start. So that's always the case. No problem. So you have 25 minutes and we can start right now uh, about API successful API programs. Thank you, Nelson. All right, perfect. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. And uh, welcome to uh, building a successful API program. Uh, hopefully you can all see my slides and uh, hear me. Looks like that was all confirmed. So today here in this particular session, we are going to talk about what it actually takes to run and build a successful API program. Uh, so this is not a session on REST versus GraphQL versus the use of JSON schemas versus schema evolution, uh, all versioning, all those kinds of things, although they are definitely all related. Um, what we're gonna talk about are the main considerations that you need to think about when you're actually building an API program. So one slide about TIBCO. Uh, we're a software vendor, been around for a long time, 30 plus years. Uh, really focus on three main areas of technology. Um, really the ability to connect to any information at any location, be able to expose all that information through APIs, be able to manage that data successfully through the use of things like data catalogs and data virtualization, and of course to apply AI ML against that data. So that, that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about TIBCO and what we do. Now, when you're looking at API success, as, as you all know, it's a whole theme of this particular uh, series of sessions, um, APIs are still key to the way organizations are really looking at their digital transformation strategies, whether it's actually to reduce costs, whether it's to streamline operations, whether it's to expose new functions and capabilities and data to the outside world, whether it's to allow developers to build applications, partners to interact with you. APIs are still key to what a lot of organizations are looking at when it comes to digital transformation. Right? So that's still, still a hot topic, uh, still very much a key part of the conversations I have with customers. Although I do have to say that the types of conversations I have with regards to APIs has changed. And we will talk a little bit about that through this particular presentation. I call this my buzzword compliance slide. And you know, when you look at APIs, APIs can really be discussed, talked about, implemented in a variety of different contexts. So I have a lot of organizations now looking at things like IoT. And so of course, APIs can play a big role in IoT and edge computing. How do you access those devices? What kind of API abstraction layer can I put in front of the devices? And you see open source frameworks like the EdgeX Foundry framework uh, from the Linux Foundation as an example. It's heavily based on IOTs, even down to uh, on on IoT APIs, even down to uh, the low device level. Right? So that's a key aspect of it. When you talk about all the latest and greatest ways of deploying services, whether it's in a serverless function, kind of arc, as a service architecture, uh, whether it's around service meshes, whether it's, whether it's around straight up microservices, APIs, of course, are a key component of all of those discussions. Typically, how do I invoke the function? How do I invoke the microservice? How do I bundle those APIs together and so on? 
but as you can see, APIs effectively can fall under many, many different categories. Uh, a lot of my conversations when it comes to data and data management are around data as APIs. Uh, and it's also around things like event-driven APIs, right? APIs are not just request reply anymore. Um, APIs don't necessarily equate to REST. So how do you event enable your APIs? And then how do you manage, govern, and control access to those APIs just like you would any other sort of API? Right, so these are all very much relevant. APIs are part of these discussions. Uh, maybe they're not the primary driver, but they're definitely a, a key focus of how these capabilities are being implemented within organizations today. And they're everywhere. I mean, this is a simple example. I've got, I've got a simple web page here, but as you can see, it's nothing but a series of APIs. Whether you're looking at product information, whether you're looking at the price data, whether you're looking at cross-sell, upsell, AIML models, scoring, whatnot, behind the scenes, APIs are driving this particular representation of information to the user. Now, APIs are also driving different forms of interaction now with data. Right, this is your kind of standard approach, but even things like augmented reality or the broader extended reality are also heavily dependent on APIs in terms of how they get the data and how they actually render it to the user through the variety of devices that people now have available to them. And so, so APIs are still key, right? Organizations are looking to implement APIs, as I mentioned, for a variety of different reasons. You got some of them that are actually listed here, but it's not just a technical problem, right? There needs to be a whole API program that underpins the way in which you're bringing forward APIs either within your organization or between your organization and consumers or other third parties, All right? So that's what we're gonna talk about here today. We're gonna talk about what is that API program and you know, many organizations have one in place already. Maybe they're looking to evolve it to the next stage. Other organizations are maybe looking to formally establish now an API program and other ones may be quite mature. And so there's still going to be different aspects of what goes into an API program that hopefully all those different audiences at those different levels of maturity can, can draw upon. All right, so we're gonna talk about a number of different areas. I'm just gonna build this out. But when you're dealing with an API program, there's an aspect of monetization, and that can either be direct or indirect. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. How do you actually measure the success of your API program? And of course, one of the ways that you can do that is through monetization and, and measuring the value associated with that. Of course, you need to look at how you staff your API program. Who, who should be part of that program? What roles do you need? You need to understand how to build the business case. And maybe not just when you're first establishing the API program, but when you're trying to establish the fact that the program should continue and either, you know, either along the same lines or even expand going forward, right? So how do you prove that? How do you understand who your audience is and how do you build an experience that tailor is tailored to that audience? How do you apply the API lifecycle as part of your API program? How do you know what to build? How are you going to build it? And then how do you set yourself up for the future, right? So these are many of the topics that you need to consider when you're looking at APIs and API programs. So making money, one of the topics that uh, typically comes up uh, in many ways, uh, it's sort of shifted. At, at first, everybody thought we could make billions of dollars with their APIs uh, through direct charge. So for every time you invoked an API, you could charge for that and make you know, billions of dollars again based upon that. Uh, that ne isn't necessarily always the case, right? There's other ways in which you can monetize your APIs. And this slide lists some of the other mechanisms. Uh, so for example, you may have a situation where you provide some sort of software capability, some product or what have you, um, you may then offer a higher you know, sort of level of that software that includes API access. And of course, when you offer that higher level of capability, you can potentially charge for that information as well. Right? So APIs can be all, almost be used to just sort of enrich or act as a kind of an upsell onto an existing software platform. You can, of course, use APIs just to drive revenue generating activities. And Amazon would be a great example of this. Right? So all of the APIs and whatnot that Amazon exposes uh, is, is really almost like a side benefit of what they were building originally. You can use this to structure your strategic partnerships. So I want to interact better with my, my partners. Um, I want to interact better with customers, developers, whoever it might be. I can, of course, use APIs to drive that form of monetization. And then in many cases, if you're looking at it from an enterprise standpoint, APIs can actually drive internal operational efficiency. Right? I want to be able to connect my systems sooner, faster, better, cheaper. I want to be able to expose API capabilities so that systems are not accessing the mainframe directly. 
Uh, I want to be able to package up those APIs and give them to a, a mobile application or a, another channel, a web channel, or other types of applications. It right? could be, again, things like extended reality. They, they can all utilize that core API base. And then in many cases, that'll actually drive out other types of monetization, even if you started with the intent of improving operational efficiency. And so monetization, how you're gonna measure the success of each of these categories, if you will, if, and you, just, you don't have to fall just in one, you can actually fall under a, a couple of these if you wish. Uh, but it's a it's a key aspect of something you need to need to consider with your API program. Now, who do you need? And I, I tend to focus more on the role um, as opposed to saying, "Hey, I need you know, however many circles are on this particular slide." You, you don't necessarily need that many people on your API team. Now, one thing I do talk about though is the fact that you should go through each one of these roles and at least decide consciously whether you need that role or not. And so you may assign multiple roles to an individual. You may say that no, based upon the structure of my API program, how it's gonna be measured and the business value and goals behind the program, I may not need every single one of these roles, but you should at least ask yourself if you do. And of course, this can change over time. So as your API program evolves, you may discover that you need maybe more importance on one role or the other, or the priority may shift, or you may need additional support because now you have more APIs exposed to the outside world. And so documentation and samples and, and, and those kinds of things have become more important. But look at the roles. Again, it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one with a person, a physical person, but it, it's definitely a role that you need to look at and evaluate and determine what should be part of the, the program. And when you're, I always say for marketing, don't forget about the fact that even if your APIs are only internal, you still have to market them. You still have to explain to other development groups within your organization why they're valuable, the fact that they're even there, how they would use them, and the benefits they get from doing so. Okay. So there still is an aspect of internal marketing, uh, even if that's the only way you're currently using your APIs. Now, building a business case. This is always a fun one. So there's this, how do I justify having an API program? How do I make sure that it continues to get the funding that it needs? And I can get the people that I need on my program. Well, one of the ways in which you're gonna do that is making sure that first of all, you're aligning to the business goals of the organization. Okay? There's no sense in having an API program that's completely conflicts with everything that the organization is, is focused on. Right? So you definitely need to align to the business goals and, and never kind of forget that. Um, now, of course, those can change for a variety of different reasons, acquisitions, new executive teams, and so on. So you need to make sure that you're always following those goals. There's technical aspects and there's the business aspects. Right? You need to consider both in your, in your API program business case. And, and you really wanna think of it as a business model. And as a result, one of the ways that I often work with customers uh, when it comes to actually building this business model is to use something like the business model canvas. Now, this is typically a framework that you use when you're designing and creating and, and almost coming up with the business case behind a startup. And in many ways, you can think of the API program as, as somewhat similar. So you need to look at things like, well, who are the key partners? Right? What key activities do you need as part of your program to achieve the value that you've identified? What resources do you need? What's the value prop of the program? Who you, are you going to be interacting with? Who are your customers? And over what channels are you gonna be interacting with these customers? And how do you group those customers into different segments? Because of course, APIs that are exposed to maybe a citizen developer could be different than APIs that are exposed to the hardcore open source developer. Right? So that can be different. So you're not gonna market to them in the same way um, because you're not gonna meet the needs of each of those different segments. And then of course, you need to look at things like costs. You need to look at things like the revenue streams, cost savings, uh, additional capabilities that it's going to bring. And then I've got a number of, of metrics that are uh, listed there that people will typically use when again, measuring the success of their API program. So whether you're looking at, you know, how much does it cost to acquire a customer? Uh, what's the average revenue per user, the lifetime customer value, the contract values, the amount of savings, the reduction in development costs, uh, you know, how quickly now you can build new organizational product capabilities. These are all things that you're going to want to decide up front. And I always say that this becomes part of a regular health check. You don't just do this once and say, great, I've got my API program. That you're going to continuously do this through regular checkpoints, regular health checks, to make sure that you're still aligned with the goals, your measure, your 
You're essentially following the metrics that you need to hit. And if you need to make any adjustments, you can do so uh, in a timely fashion. And so having a, a kind of a form of a business case is an important part of a, an API program. And, and as I mentioned, when you're building this program, make sure you understand your audience. If you're selling effectively access to your APIs to external audiences, that's going to be very different than, of course, dealing with internal audiences. But even if you're dealing with internal audiences, are you dealing with the front end mobile development team or are you dealing with the mainframe application support team? Right? That can be very, very different in terms of how you convey the value and the types of services you build that, that kind of back the, the, uh, the APIs that you're creating and so on. So it, it's really around understanding who you're working with, their needs, and then making sure your program has aspects in place to meet those needs. Right? You're, you're creating the best experience for your target audience. Of course, then you go through the life cycle. So you're gonna go through from, you know, you have a great idea all the way straight through to when you're deployed your APIs uh, and even thinking about how you're gonna deprecate that API eventually, all right? So all these now, this is your more traditional process, right? And, and again, not saying that this is a sequential series of steps. A lot of these things happen in parallel. You're gonna test mock applications. You wanna test your API contract earlier rather than later. You wanna put security in place again earlier rather than later. This isn't meant to be um, a sequential diagram. It's just meant to show that there are different stages when it comes to an API development lifecycle. And things like versioning become very, very important. Uh, the measurement and monitoring of your APIs, not just from a performance standpoint, but also from a business value standpoint. And then those metrics are also gonna tell you who's using what, how much, and whether you're actually uh, supporting them properly, um, or whether you see a, an opportunity where you can deploy and use new APIs in order to achieve, again, greater efficiencies, uh, more revenue or whatever it happens to be, right? So it, it's this idea of just sp pay special attention to these stages um, and make sure that they do fit into the way in which your organization uh, builds software. And, and don't forget the cultural and organizational structure aspects of this, right? Uh, Mel or, uh, yeah, Melvin Con uh, Conway, right? Conway's Law, uh, so you build software according to the way your organization is structured. Remember that when you're actually building your APIs and running your API program. So don't shortcut the design stage. Make sure you're building a solid API contract. Look at all the different specifications that are out there, whether it's the schema definition languages, open API specs, the async API spec, and so on. That's gonna form the basis of everything else that you do. Right? That API model, that contract is key. Automate everything. CICD is obviously very important here. When you think you've automated everything, automate again. Um, and then also understand how you're gonna be deploying these APIs, right? Is it public cloud? Is it private cloud? Is it a hybrid? Is it a service mesh? Are they synchronous in nature, asynchronous in nature? Is it a backend for front end pattern? Do you need sagas to choreograph the different APIs? These are all gonna be considerations that you need to think about when you're actually going through your API lifecycle. Just another view of the stages. So again, testing, test as early as possible, right? Test those contracts to make sure that the contract is valid before you go ahead and implement all the backend logic behind that contract, right? And I also say, bring the security up front to this level um, before you actually get to the point where, you know, you de deploy everything and everything's running and you know, oh, well, yeah, I need security, so we should add that as an afterthought. Bring that as far forward as possible. Okay. Now, of course, there's many different ways that you're gonna wrap your API program. So you tend to look at things like API gateways, API management platforms. When you're doing so though, you wanna look at a number of criteria, right? So you wanna look at the key capabilities you need to match and meet your business goals as defined by the business value that you've identified, right? Then you wanna take those, come up with a set of criteria that you need in order to make sure that if you're going after an API gateway or service mesh or an API management platform or whatever that is, you wanna make sure that all of that is aligned, right? But the key is you're trying to create kind of this idea of a central location, maybe not physically deployed that way, but a single view into which you can come and see what's going on with your APIs, provide a single developer experience, uh, provide a developer portal so that people can do things like you know, get their own keys, play around with the APIs, do some testing, you know, all those kinds of things without actually having to go through and, and, and necessarily even talk to you in, in certain cases. Right? So that, that platform can form the kind of core foundational piece 
of an overall API program, at least from a technology standpoint. Now, when you look at what's coming, it's just APIs in many other different contexts, right? So, um, you know, we've, I've talked about this. There's things like APIs from an IoT context. There's things like AI ML for things like um, even, even using APIs to expose machine learning algorithms, uh, but also using APIs and AI ML together for things like API discovery. So I, if I have a whole bunch of APIs, which one is the best fit for me? And you can use AI ML techniques in order to determine that. You can also use AI ML to determine behavior. You know, what is normal for API data flows and access versus what is abnormal? And maybe a, an AI ML model can help us help with that. Um, as I mentioned, APIs are not just about request reply, they can be event driven, and then they can be used in different contexts, right? Whether it's delivering data for the purposes of natural language processing, extended reality, even wrapping blockchain with APIs, looking at some of the emerging trends around autonomic computing, uh, and then all the standards that are related, right? Whether it's fire, open banking, a new distribution capability and the airline industry and so on. Right? So there's just a continual evolution here of APIs. And of course you can layer these. So for example, you may be using data as APIs. Um, and so these, these elements that you are, have expo you want to expose as data from the underlying data sources, these elements then can be exposed via APIs to API consumers. And now they're using data, let's say, to facilitate their data as APIs to facilitate a, a self-service analytics process. Right? So it's not just about a business function like um, you know, creating an order or things like that. It can actually be a way to augment your analytics platform uh, and be able to make, you know, again, multiple data sources look like they're a single data source, build different views, expose that as APIs, and then consume that in a variety of different form factors. Right? So a lot, of, a lot of different ways in which you can utilize these APIs. But really, it, it's around making sure that your API program is aligned to the goals of the organization. You understand what it is that you're trying to build, who you're trying to build it for. You've got the right people in place. You are following a API lifecycle and a development process that, again, fits within the guidance of your API uh, architect and the broader you know, organization as a whole. And, and you're really setting yourself up as that foundation for the future, right? creating that best of breed innovation and facilitating a faster time to market, all part of your digital transformation strategy. So that's a little bit about the API program. And uh, I, I get to put in one, uh, one commercial. So uh, by all means, there's more details in my recently published book uh, around this. We go into a bit more detail in each one of these areas. Um, feel free, of course, to pick that up on, uh, on Amazon. And with that, that's the end of my session. Thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Yeah, Nelson, we have one question for one, uh, time for one question, actually. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, the question is, uh, how do you onboard uh, the business stakeholders into uh, making uh, API programs successful? Right. Yeah, I mean, and that's a key aspect of this. It, it can't just be technology for technology's sake. And so really what you need to do is get them on board early, try and understand their needs, try and understand what it is that they're trying to achieve as a, as a business. Um, and so, and then from there, you're trying to see what you can do to facilitate that that interaction, if you will, both from, a, again, a technology and business value standpoint. So include them in the development of that business case. See what it is that they want to measure. What are their business goals? And then how can APIs actually map back to enabling those goals? Um, and so, for example, maybe they want to expose data as APIs and allow more rapid access to information in their particular business. Uh, that could be for the purposes of being better able to provide cross-sell upsell offers to customers or identify fraud or do predictive maintenance or whatever those things are, that there's some set of business goals that eventually as you drill down, APIs are gonna enable that. So make sure they're involved, make sure you put the metrics in place to measure that early, show them how the APIs are enabling their business goals and, and continue to work with them. Yeah, I think there are great answers and that will help a lot of uh, API stakeholders into onboarding their business partners. Thank you very much, Nelson. You can now uh, disconnect your uh, screen uh, sharing and, and go back to your day work. <laughs> yeah, thank, you very, thank you very much. And TIPCO has a booth at the event. So if you want more information about um, how, to, how to be successful with API programs, don't hesitate to, to stop by there. Thank you very much, Nelson. Now we receive uh, Claire Barrett, uh, Director of API First Consulting about pain relief for whole lifestyle changes, health and well-being strategies for a maturing API program. 
So Claire, uh, actually Claire uh, shared some articles on LinkedIn recently that has some, uh, let's say API buzz, let's call it like that. Uh, some API buzz and with a lot of uh, feedbacks and comments. And so we're really glad to have her uh, um, on stage uh, uh, for presenting her, her research. Uh, so uh, yeah, Claire, are you in the backstage? Uh, to be able to join us. Yeah, if you can hear us. Perfect, yeah, the stage is, is large, so it takes time to walk in the center uh, of the stage. Yeah, hello, Claire, how are hello, you? Good now. Yeah, so we have, it's perfect timing to share your uh, slides. And, uh, and so you have 25 minutes uh, uh, to present your research on the well-being of API programs, right? Thank you, Mehdi. Is it working? Perfect. Can people see that all right? Yeah, perfect. We hear you. We see the slides. Awesome. Thank you, Mehdi, and uh, good evening from the UK. Uh, my name is Claire Barrett, and I make strategy happen. API-enabled change calls for making a lot of small and some large decisions along the way. And I'm going to speak for the next 20 minutes or so about managing key trade-offs at large and medium complexity organizations that face individuals, the API teams, and their stakeholders. Um, and we'll be talking about how to reach a level of API maturity as being like supporting the organization's broader transformation of a community moving into, if you like, new and unfamiliar territories and lands that call for new skills and capabilities and have a number of key decisions along the way. Um, those trade-offs uh, can be described as being seen through the eyes of, if you like, uh, a, a physicians, um, the, the, me the medics for the community, um, the people who are going to help uh, work out what are some of the short-term pain relievers uh, that might need to be applied to help people along the way, and what are some of the uh, more extensive elite athlete regimes that are going to um, uh, build strength at all levels in the organization. So how does the community get fitter and healthier as a whole to create an environment in which APIs will be successful and they'll be able to adapt? The research I've been doing uh, is with uh, seasoned um, IT and change professionals. So you could think of them perhaps as the, the, the medical board, the group of um, uh, uh, experienced people who have been driving change in large complex organizations and they would measure their experience in uh, decades more than in years. And uh, through in-depth interviews with them, I've been uh, sensing and, and uh, establishing what are some of the trade-offs they make and where would they put their efforts at key points during their maturity. Um, we're going to look at uh, that maturity place as, across three stages for APIs. So getting to pilot, which is a little bit like um, reaching the first mountain uh, in this uh, um, long transformational move to a, to a new world. Um, reaching that first mountain, seeing the view from the top and uh, opening up opportunities more broadly for new APIs moving beyond uh, pilots into um, then having uh, parts of the community moving into these new uh, richer sources of, of um, before they actually look to scale out beyond the enterprise. And through that process, uh, are going to get perhaps uncomfortable, but also then comfortable in the, the new environment in which they're working. At the outset, on the first stage of um, work, the, uh, you're looking to ask the question about which APIs are you going to build first? Uh, and you're also going to be seeking guidance on uh, or looking to find out how much executive support and how much big uh, directional change you're going to need to move the, the environment and the behavior into somewhere that APIs are going to be successful. Um, 
early on, this is a little bit like presenting with chronic back pain. Uh, you, you really need to get some pain relief to reduce the inflammation before you can have a sensible conversation with people about maybe some lifestyle changes like taking half an hour's exercise every day or um, getting more sleep. Um, for, from the research that I did with large organizations, people said that they would put more than half of their effort, about 60% on average, and three quarters of that effort in, in lower complexity organizations into solving uh, problems that are being experienced by customers and employees today. So finding APIs that perhaps are not going to be the, the, the really big game changers in time, but the things that are going to get pain out of the system, that are going to make a process faster, more efficient, and will um, start creating a story that will resonate uh, broadly with people. Um, interestingly, in more higher complex organizations, uh, guidance was as you embark on change of this uh, this nature that you um, are also going to need to balance off and put effort into getting some um, broader uh, symbols of change behind things. So by that we mean um, uh, working with your stakeholders to uh, uh, get them to back uh, perhaps some you know key minimum standards, uh, um, security expectations for every type of API that might not be uh, needed seem to be needed in the early days, but that will build the good foundations, um, build the good behaviors for longer term change. So as you move beyond that first, um, scaled the first mountain, and now um, other teams are getting on board and looking to uh, develop APIs that can propagate uh, um, and uh, reimagine customer experiences, can start getting efficiencies into um, uh, reaching into new markets. Uh, you've got um, another trade-off to be thinking about, about how to get your messages resonating with the communities that are going to help um, spread the word more broadly. So uh, this is about how to get heard in the crowd and how to sustain commitment for ongoing investment. Um, uh, what I heard in the research was that people are going to expect to have their story told um, uh, it will be more effective to put their efforts into um, messaging that will resonate with customers and employees close to the cold face of activity. And they put twice their effort into that from um, seeking ongoing um, uh, visibility to stakeholders such as investors, regulators, external um, uh, entities. So that um, balance will is, is kind of like um, uh, focusing on each API, getting traction and leverage and, and being ampl amplifying success, but then spending some effort on asking for maybe uh, some of the big um, lifestyle training facilities uh, that, that you need. So uh, this could be API lifecycle management, uh, technology support, uh, tooling, skills, um, training, getting visibility and access. As you're getting beyond pilot, you'll also be absorbing and building new habits and um, skills to be able to survive in this, uh, survive and thrive in this new world. Um, the sorts of API behaviors that you can be looking to recruit and um, upskill and reward people for being involved in are going to be around disciplined engineering, um, establishing data-driven process design, incentivizing people to operate beyond their usual boundaries and uh, building cultures as well that will support processes, not just the technologies. Um, so you'll also be looking at new ways of going about the change. And you've got a, a, a um, uh, as you get good at delivering IT enabled change, which APIs are, are enabling you to do, you're going to be looking to get much shorter increments of, of change out. And when I asked stakeholder, um, uh, the research participants about whether they would put more effort into uh, getting really good at experimentation, failing fast, or whether they would prefer to take um, time box iterations of planned progress uh, as ways of achieving this faster execution. Um, in large, higher complexity organizations, people uh, looked to put twice of their effort into building skills at actually being really good at experimentation and failing fast. 
Uh, in lower complexity organisations, people were more comfortable with building um, iterations of, of plan change that they would be able to justify at each step. But in an API, in large organisations, you'd be looking for experimentation in both API coverage, in API um, uh, usage, in uh, developer experiences, in toolings. Each, each iteration of a cycle of change is going to be broaden out coverage as well as capability. As you start uh, um, moving um, 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 much more of a migration of your, your, your overall organization to this uh, newer ways of working, um, you will be calling on uh, significant diversity and, and breadth of uh, experience in, in the people that are going to make API successful for you. Um, they effectively represent the diversity of your own business. You're going to need people who deeply understand uh, the business operational activities that are being uh, automated and replaced, people that are going to be able to um, apply commercial acumen to APIs as products uh, to um, uh, identify, spot um, and work on the things that are going to make a real difference and be able to pick out uh, potentially weak signals in the, the volumes of data uh, that are being um, uh, now managed and seen and processed by your API capability. With your growing success of APIs as your portfolio broadens, you will also expect to see a growth in the demand for your uh, time, effort and support in, in um, making that uh, available to people. So if it felt like you were early on um, kind of at a market stall, uh, shouting for um, uh, people to come and um, uh, listen to your story and hear the successes. Now it may feel more like that there's everybody crowding at your stall and they're queued out behind this, you know, around the street um, in order to be able to get access to your time, your expertise and your uh, tooling, your experience. So um, you need to be uh, thinking about your role in the uh, community of actors that make APIs successful in your organization. And uh, you may have more than one of these roles, but we typically uh, see that people are either the elders sponsoring the change, um, they're uh, the explorers uh, taking, um, uh, looking for API opportunities on, on new, new mountains, uh, um, and or they are um, uh, providing broader roadmaps for the uh, technology expectations and so on, the navigators. Um, uh, we've given some examples here of the types of things that could be important to any of those groups at a point in time in an organization. And the, uh, the, 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 the balance and the, the, the sweet spot that you need to find is in the intersection between these capabilities. Uh, there is always a, uh, a limit on how much um, uh, people can invest and, and support in how many of these things at any one point in time. And this is where uh, there's going to be less focus on pain relief and more on uh, long term lifestyle changes uh, around uh, API engineering disciplines, around um, uh, uh, propagating an API mindset across uh, many, uh, many more levels of the organization in order for it to realize the, the full potential. So seeing where you can make the most impact and uh, I think also carrying on from the, from the previous presentation, measuring and, uh, um, and tracking your progress uh, ultimately is, is absolutely critical. Ultimately, your API change is, is changing something. Uh, the challenge for, for many is what is it actually changing that is not also being changed uh, by um, or influenced by many other things that are going on in the organization's broader uh, change and transformation. Uh, so when I asked um, in my research about whether people would in um, uh, would put uh, would invest in uh, demonstrating the impact of their IT change on uh, today's known business performance measures, um, you know, revenues, efficiencies, etc or whether they would put their efforts into uh, setting um, new bars uh, and then meeting those bars and potentially changing those measures along the way. What I heard from them was that they would put about 55% um, uh, of their effort 
uh, and 60% at higher complexity organizations into uh, continuously building and improving on the measurement systems that they were using to show their API uh, success. So uh, measuring the number of APIs at an early uh, pilot stage um, uh, is uh, maybe useful, but it is certainly not over time. You're going to be wanting to look uh, at more mature uh, and uh, growing uh, measures that will show how you are making this continuous improvement and your experimentation process is likely to be uh, brought to life through this um, and or your iterative change as you go. So if you're uh, involved in, in managing change and you're putting less than half of your effort into bar raising and, and more into bar setting, then, then you're in good company. So API maturity involves trade-offs regardless of where you are in the journey and recognizing their contribution to your organization's broader success is going to be key to supporting and enabling that greater digital transformation. Uh, to be balanced and pragmatic with your responses, uh, you need to get the right messaging, you need to focus on the right measures that are going to be right at the right point in time, and you need to uh, build around you capability with the right diversity to be successful. Uh, so in summary, pain relief can give you space, but it's really the lifestyle changes that pay off in the long term and that will build your health and resilience to thrive and adapt to the change that is around you. Uh, now we do have some time for questions, or I'm happy to. Um, uh, Happy to go back um, if anybody wanted to follow up on particular slides. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you, Claire. So it relates also, uh, we have uh, one question about like uh, how to onboard the business people, you know, about the three circle bubbles you present, uh, you know, from the, the sponsors, the technology. Mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, yeah, so if you can go back on that slide, maybe. Uh, sure. Uh, on her, yeah. How how do you how do each one convince each other uh, into how onboarding the API program? Yeah. So the question is how do, how do, how do they influence each other? So um, the the elders are going to be influencing the transformers. With um, they're going to be expecting them to uh, push the boundary for finding new and more adventurous um, opportunities for APIs, but the explorers are going to be working to influence the sponsors. Um, and, and typically the explorers, they, they, they may live in functions like, um, they may be called the digital transformation team, the innovators. Um, their opportunity is to um, uh, bring great ideas to the sponsors and really in, um, uh, and interpret those, but the spot, but it, and explain what things like an ecosystem play, what an API capability actually will do for the organization strategically and explain that this is not a, just a tech thing or an IT thing. Transformers can influence technologists with the, um, uh, the types of opportunities, but they're going to be collaborating really closely on each other's skills. The technologists are going to be providing the uh, developer portals experiences, the, um, the, the right light touch uh, governments, the, the empowerment and capability they're going to be looking at tooling. And technologists and the IT leaders are going to be influencing the elders community with how uh, um, IT investment in a uh, simpler and more agile architecture is going to ultimately realize the adaptability from the business change. But all three of them come together around APIs is almost like the front door into uh, the, the transformation will change more broadly. Yeah, one question about the the last the bar the bar setting versus the uh, the new metrics. Uh, how do you evolve from let's say poor metrics to more advanced metrics? Uh, you know, on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. uh, this is this has to be very much a test and learn, and it's also going to be about getting um, the right people in the team that will help because the the metrics will be very personal to the organization. Uh, particularly as you get more mature with them. Um, they are going to um, align, but it's it's about not measuring a lot of people that I spoke to in the survey called out that, that they measure too that we measure too much in many organizations. Um, we measure things that 
have a moving baseline that actually kind of can be presented in ways to pre almost to kind of counter whatever the argument is, we can go and find the data to present it. Um, to actually engineer an instrument for measures is really important. So we, we want to measure fewer things and we want to ensure that we've got the instrumentation for those to be um, uh, automatically created um, and not be, uh, and, and people being educated on how to use them. And that, that, uh, that gets, um, evolves with each experiment effectively with each step. So you've worked in, uh, in some CIO offices of uh, some large banks. Uh, how do you translate these metrics to a CIO? Um, so uh, I, I think the, the broader question is um, uh, how do you support your technology colleagues and your business colleagues in finding measurement systems that they both align and agree on? So um, uh, uh, and, and APIs are a great example of a technical capability and a uh, business process and uh, realization that um, uh, it can be quite visible and quite an easy way of actually um, brokering the conversation between those those people because a simpler um, and more um, uh, able to change architecture will deliver the type of will, will start answering a lot of the frustrations that um, uh, elders and transformers may see with um, the pace at which um, uh, IT enabled change is able to be made. So one question about diversity, how, how diverse should be the team involved in APIs in an organization? Uh, it, it, it should be, um, uh, a, 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 it should definitely be diverse in terms of um, both skills, experience, um, uh, background, uh, because Thinking differently about APIs almost requires you kind of turn the traditional thinking on its head, and uh, to get a kind of inside-out approach, you need a you need a very broad um, uh, group um, representing different ages, different um, uh, cultures, backgrounds, because they'll come with different types of thinking, and uh, they that that is also reflected in their experience. So you don't want uh, the, the, it's not it's like don't find necessarily the usual suspects to solve the, solve these types of problems. Um, uh, find in the organization perhaps um, uh, some um, uh, some people who can bring a really fresh fresh perspective. Yeah. So uh, to know more about your research, uh, how we can how we can contribute or how we can reach you. Yeah. So um, I would love for, if anybody can reach me on LinkedIn. Um, uh, we're also um, at a booth um, uh, during the break. So. Uh, during the breaks, during the US track and the European track. Um, so do uh, look uh, look me up at the Expo um, and Medi, and uh, um, I look forward to uh, hearing from any of you. Um, and I'll be around in and out too in the conference. So thank you all very much. Yeah, thank you, Claire. Thank you. You can uh, disconnect your, your screen. And now, uh, yeah, well, little, one minute uh, uh, in advance, right? So uh, maybe we can host uh, Matt uh, McClarty. All uh, right. So if Matt, you you, you can okay. You can so shall I leave? Yeah, yeah. You can you can disconnect your screen and 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 leave the stage for Matt. Thank you very much, Claire, for uh, such a great presentation. I think you already received some congratulation from the from the audience, like yeah, uh, 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 silent claps, right? Uh, and yes, we will receive uh, Matt McClary, which is a global um, EP, global leader of API strategy at MuleSoft. Well, who is also a co-author of, of a technical book about securing microservices APIs. But today he will talk to us more about a business aspect, which is API business modeling through value exchange. Hello, Matt, how are you? Hey, Mehdi, good, how are you? And thanks, Claire, good talk. Yeah, yeah, I think you invited her to a podcast recently, right? Yeah, we did a podcast uh, last week, it was published. So really great stuff on there. Yeah. So yeah, you have a uh, one minute extra. Uh, that's uh, that's free. Uh, so let's let's use it for your great content that you will share with us, as always. Uh, so uh, yeah, the stage is yours. Uh, you, your screen shared. Uh, enjoy. I, I made it through the screen share, Betty. That's all that matters here. So very uh, very happy about that. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, thanks to the API Days team for putting on such an awesome event. I really like this platform. Um, we're all in virtual conference mode, so. You know, we get a couple of hiccups here and there, but phenomenal job putting this together. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here to talk to you about business models, which 
you know, don't get too excited. Um, you know, more and more as I've dug into the API space, and as many alluded to, I've had a background where I've gone from building uh, SOAP services on HP nonstop computers to um, working in enterprise architecture at bank to working on the software vendor side and the technical roles, architectural roles. You know, my main focus lately has been around business strategy related to APIs. And I think it's a really good, it's really good timing for that. It's good timing for everyone to be thinking about APIs from a business strategy perspective, because we are making this massive shift to a digital economy out of the industrial economy. And I think that the people probably can learn the technology a little more easily than they can learn this whole new way of doing digital business. And certainly current uh, uh, pandemic circumstances have forced the uh, digital issue even more. So what I wanna talk to you about today is really a, a, an approach to how you can think about your business, think about your digital business and construct business models that will help you build thriving ecosystems for APIs and really for your overall digital business. So I, I work for MuleSoft as the global leader of API strategy, and we put out a survey every year where we work with um, leaders across our customer base, across the industry on um, trends that they're seeing around integration. And so we, we have a lot of lenses we put this through, but um, the, the, we did a big focus this year on really drilling into API strategy as well as business benefits. And I think that you know, I find that uh, these are really interesting results because we've been talking for a decade or more now on, you know, all the promise of APIs. You know, APIs can can make freshly squeezed orange juice if you want them to, right? Like there's all these things that we've been talking about for so long. We're now seeing a critical mass of organizations taking advantage of these. And here's just a, you know, the, the survey results where, we're, you know, companies we're working with leveraging APIs, they're seeing productivity gains they're seeing increased innovation. Those are maybe a little less concrete to measure, but you can read the list here. But I found the most interesting thing is that 31% of the companies we talked to have, have actually experienced revenue growth as a result of APIs. Um, and even though that's the smallest number on the, on the survey results, to me, it's the most profound one. Because if you can tie the usage of APIs back to driving revenue for your organization, I mean, that's a massive business outcome. So how are they doing that? I, you know, I think it does come down to where your APIs fit in your overall business model. And as we'll see, there are different ways of, of constructing business models, different patterns of business models. But the first thing to know is that you really need to be thinking about where your APIs fit in your business model. So I think everyone who's been in the industry for a while knows that the, uh, you know, the authoritative work on business models was done by John Musser. Uh, he, he founded Programmable Web back in 2005, uh, did, a, did a landmark presentation at the API Strat Conference in 2013. We said, called it 20 models in 20 minutes. You know, here are 20 patterns of API business models. And the way he kind of created this taxonomy of business models was to think about the perspective of, of where money was flowing. Some cases you had free APIs, some cases uh, developers would be paying, you know, you, and this is the probably the, the stereotype where companies are thinking about opening up their APIs, charging money for it, collecting new revenue streams. There's other business models where a developer might get paid um, in, in if you're exposing you know, services through APIs that are gonna drive transactions that generate revenue for a company, you might get a slice of those transactions. And then lots of different indirect models where it might not be so obvious how money is being exchanged. And this is still, an awesome uh, presentation to review, and there's lots of great examples that are cited there. So, you know, I think this is a, a great way of looking at business models. But as I got into researching business models and how things could, you know, how really what I wanted to do is come up with an approach that would allow companies to get hands on and really understand their own business models, as well as identify new opportunities and even assess. API opportunities for how valuable they'll be to the overall business. And that's where the word value really comes up. So for a while, you know, I've been following Alex Osterwalder. He's the creator of the Business Model Canvas, which has been a very useful tool. Um, I've been using Business Model Canvas 
just straight up the business model canvas to help companies identify API product opportunities. It's a great way of fleshing out the overall API ecosystem. But going back to how he defines a business model, it's all about creating, delivering, and capturing value. And in that case, value isn't necessarily um, a monetary value, right? This is really any sort of value that you could deliver. And as we move into this digital economy, as we'll see, there's lots of different ways of exchanging value that aren't necessarily about money. So, so maybe business models are really about value. Um, going into Clayton Christensen, um, if you were attending Iraqli's presentation earlier, he referenced Clayton Christensen. Clayton Christensen is the author of the Innovator's Dilemma and the Innovator's Solution, landmark uh, thinker in the, in the business world, especially in terms of deconstructing uh, the business landscape and giving very st strong lessons for this highly disruptive digital economy that we're in. But there's a concept that's fundamental to the innovator's dilemma uh, that he calls the value network. And it's really a way of looking at a business landscape and the interdependencies between all the entities in a business landscape. So if you're a company and you want to look at what your value network is, you have to consider who your customers are, who all the suppliers are in delivering products and services to your customers. And what you find in a value network is that there are there's really an interconnected set of business models. So you might have retailers and wholesalers working together to fulfill customers' shopping needs, so on. So this idea of a value network and thinking about a topology of uh, entities that are exchanging value in different ways to ultimately fulfill consumer need I think is a very powerful way of looking at the digital economy. And if you think about how the, the, the different interactions in that value network between the nodes can look at those as, as value exchange and you know interfaces very much in the digital sense leads us to APIs. But this, I, you know, what, what actually started me on this path was a, a book that I'd read, great uh, product management book by Melissa Perry called Escaping the Build Trap. And she really opens the book um, goes into phenomenal detail and a whole other topic area of, of product management, but starts it off by always considering what is your value exchange? What are the products or services you're offering to customers that fulfill, solve their problems and fulfill their wants and needs for which they're willing to exchange money, right? And, and with all this in mind, thinking about value networks, thinking about value exchange, and then thinking about the idea of delivering, capturing, and creating value, wanted to apply this into the API space. But first, we can, you know, just to get familiar with the how you might construct a value exchange based business model, here's the retailer wholesaler model, right? How does this all work? Well, shoppers want goods, and so they go to a retailer to get their products and they're going to buy them there. Now, theoretically, they could go to all the different wholesalers, all the different product suppliers, and get their products, but the retailer adds value on top of those products by providing one place to go uh, per, by providing targeted products. You know, you might go to a grocery store for food. You might go to a home improvement store if you're working on house projects. So, so what is the retailer doing that they're going to charge a premium on the products? They're providing, they're adding value by consolidating the, the store, consolidating the products, giving selection to the shoppers who can go to one place and get what they need. A more sophisticated business model we might look at we could look back at the print media newspaper model where, and, and there's still a lot of newspapers have kind of adopt, ad adapted this to the digital space where readers want news and they, you know, for certain content, they're willing to pay money for it. At the same time, product companies want to advertise in media. And so they're willing to pay the newspaper as well. Um, and at the same time, newspapers have their own writers, but they may be hiring freelance journalists to, to, to create content. So here we're seeing different types of value being exchanged content. Um, exposure is a, an interesting value proposition here where that's really what the newspaper is providing to the product companies access to, a, to an audience. And I think where, where this really becomes interesting is, is if we juxtapose that media model against Facebook, right? Why has Facebook been so disruptive in the media space? Well, they're offering this, the content without charging for it. Right. Not only that, they're giving a path for users to provide content. And a lot of the content that people are going to social media for is content about their friends and connections lives. 
and they are still getting third parties who are supplying um, supplying games and, and other apps that maybe they're exchanging money for. But the big value proposition here, and the reason Facebook has gone from having no business model to being multi-business, multi-million dollar of revenue every year is the precision of targeting on advertising that they're offering. I know we're in an interesting time now where a lot of retailers or a lot of product companies are actually at this moment boycotting uh, Facebook, but that's a whole other story. But the fact remains, the precision of their, their ad targeting based on the content and data that they're collecting from users is really driving their business model. So rather than look at just pricing schemes and you know maybe looking at a one pager, if we start to build a map, a topology for how these businesses are constructed by looking at the different exchanges of value between all the entities in this value network, it can become a pretty powerful tool for breaking down how you can drive value through your APIs. Now, just on the topic of these business models, um, through this whole research uh, process, I actually came across a, a company based in the Netherlands, here are the two founders, uh, who are using this approach, breaking down business models through value exchange, and they did a very deep dive on Facebook. They've done Netflix, and they've got a, a whole bunch of other uh, examples that they worked through. So I. You know, if you want to dig deeper on this, it's it's really profound stuff. Getting into not only these more party to you know third party exchanges of value, but digging into the the underpinnings and the and the uh, the infrastructure provision and so on that goes into business models as well. So a good follow up read. But let's pivot now to talk about APIs. I think it's fair to say that a stereotypical API value exchange would look something like this. We've got an API provider and they're offering some sort of service to a set of consumers, usually those consumers are the ones who are actually building the systems of experience, the mobile apps, the web apps that are gonna be exposed to end users. There's lots of different value though that can be exchanged. And I think if we look back at the Melissa Perry example, you know, she was talking about products and services being exchanged for money. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, I would say that's the, uh, the manufacturing, the 20th century value exchange in most business models. What, what's really interesting now, I think, is what we can do with data. So in the Facebook example, we saw Facebook's, what they're collecting from users, aside from content, is lots of data that they're using to correlate the, the user's relationships, interests, and then feeding that into their ad targeting, right? So, uh, and we can look at Google, if we can look at Netflix recommendations and Amazon recommendations, all the big digital players who are who are really driving the digital economy are experts at capturing data as value and then creating value through that data for other exchanges and their value networks. But I think even that one might be a little bit obvious for people in the digital space. There's lots of stuff and, and lots of great work that can be done on understanding how data can create value. But there are, other, there are other types of value that you can create. And I think this is where we get into some uniqueness around APIs, because the types of consumers that you're gonna have for APIs are developers, right? A lot of the work being done to build solutions that are using APIs done by developers. So on one hand, we, we saw the example of exposure as being getting access to an audience uh, as, as a value proposition that can be given kind of on the back end. But at the same time, there's a big value proposition around time. And, and so let's go into some examples where I, I like to call these value currencies. Um, this is kind of a way of, of really getting into how you can uh, drive, drive uh, value in your API business models. So here's a pattern that I'll call the API supplier business model. And the example we're gonna use is Google Maps, right? So Google Maps has a very, um, has been in the in the game for quite a while. You know, it's been an API for web API for uh, almost you know the history of the uh, web API, the API economy. Um, you've got best of breed functionality, unique data that Google is able to go out and offer for a premium. So people are happy to come up, and, and there's lots of examples of of applications that have been built on top of Google Maps API. Uh, we'll see some of those, but the the 
interesting thing here is I think Google is able to both charge money for the use of their API, which is then being used to provide location-enabled services to end users, but at the same time, they're able to collect all the information about who's making the call, what are they looking for, and again, factoring that in, into their data analysis, which is then used for their ad targeting. So they're actually creating one value network around providing location services, but then they're extracting data from that value network and injecting it into their advertising value network. So even though this is a very simple example on the surface, you can see where uh, if you really drill down on the thinking, you can get even deeper value. Now here's a pattern that I, that I really like because I think it's an eye opener for a lot of companies that are just getting into the digital space and especially into the API space. Twilio has been a phenomenal success story in the API economy for a long time. They, they tick all the boxes on, on how, to be, how, to, how to be a strong API product company. They have a very specific targeted set of services around communication APIs that can be built into applications. Um, they started out just following the, the App Store launch from Apple and really helped a lot of developers take advantage of all the facilities on the iPhone and, and built up their business to now they're uh, you know, a billion dollar publicly traded company. But they also spent a ton of time catering their services for developers to make it easy for developers to sign up, make it easier for developers to build those solutions and reducing all the friction and getting developers on board. But if you look at what they're doing, they're really taking a set of backend telco APIs and offering those in, in a consolidated form and in a very developer friendly form. So this is very much like that retailer wholesaler model that we saw earlier. What Twilio is effectively doing is curating all these different telco APIs, providing global service based on the number of, of communication uh, backend services they offer, and then catering that to their consumers, the developers who are gonna be building solutions with that. So I call this the API retailer business model because they're actually acting much like a retailer would with goods in the in the uh, you know in the in the bricks and mortar retailer industry here they're retailing communication services and this is a pattern i think that shows you just by taking just by creating value through time to market right time to market by giving app developers one place to go to get all their communication services as well as giving time to market by making it easier for developers to build applications that's a huge value proposition that's allowed them to charge a premium on top of the services they're using at the back end. Now, just one more archetype of business model here is, you know, the industry sort of calls this in the at least in the business model industry, they call this the aggregator business model. It's really a two sided marketplace model. But let's look at what Airbnb is doing, right? Or, or Uber or Lyft and so on. A lot of these places where you've got um, you're generating a two-sided marketplace of suppliers and consumers. Here, um, again, Airbnb is able to build momentum up as they get more listings, as they get more scale, they're actually offering a marketplace for property owners to list their properties, which you know they're, they're gonna get that content. Essentially, that's inventory for their marketplace in exchange for exposure initially and ultimately when, when renters uh, book the properties, they're gonna exchange money, but they're gonna actually control the transaction. And, and for the renters and the consumers, they're offering an aggregated marketplace, one place to go where you can find all the properties. And again, you're gonna, the value they get is as they build up their scale of having a large audience to appeal to, then that's gonna make it more appealing for property owners. So this is really a, a flywheel or a, or a momentum based business model where the more property owners listing and the more renters, it just it just builds momentum. But from, um, from an API perspective here, this really allows Airbnb to offer its services, not just through its own applications, but to connect into places like multiple listing services for property owners, as well as getting to other digital channels for, for captive audience on the other side. So just with the you know the amount of time I've had, um, it's uh, it's we're not there's there's some other maybe more complex examples that we can go into, um, and I think this is a really exciting. We're just scratching the surface here, but I think what what's really interesting about all this is we've been talking about this notion of API ecosystems for a long time, and trying to figure out how we define 
API ecosystems. And you know, a big part of the guidance that I give to companies when working with them on business strategy is to really think through your ecosystem. I think what this does is shows that API ecosystems are, are essentially the value network for APIs. And if we think about things in that term, in those terms, we can then consider all the different touch points we have in the ecosystem and consider what type of value we're adding to all the different entities in there. So there is a lot more to dig into. I recently wrote a blog on this. Uh, Mike Amundsen and I did a podcast uh, uh, to, to get into the, the details of this. If you want to look into the value engineers, the, the group in the Netherlands that I mentioned, I, I included the link here. But also, um, Nielsoft, we've developed a set of of API program workshops to really help engage with organizations on their API strategies. We have a whole API as a product workshop and this value exchange business model thinking is a big part of that. So you can check out the strategy hub or go visit our MuleSoft booth during the break. But uh, thanks everyone. And I think I had left a bit of time for questions. Yes, yes, for sure. And uh, we have a first question. Uh, uh, what Twilio did to telcos is what Stripe did to pay many APIs. Do you agree with that? I completely agree. Those are the two big retailer models that I would cite. Um, and, uh, I th I'm sorry. I, I, I think that as we get into um, as we get into other industries, like open banking is, is taking off, uh, and even insurance, like where you see lots of quotes and so on. I think there's there. I think I think that every industry there may be a retailer type opportunity here as, as digital services mature. Yeah, and I know Impala is trying to do that for hotels and uh, Plaid actually was doing that for banking. Uh, one question about the, uh, how free is important in value exchange and how to engage your company into free, uh, let's say API consumptions, being able to collect data or, you know, like uh, specific assets that will make you a winner at the end. So you know, this is something I could I could talk for another half an hour on. Um, I think there's there's the the pure business argument, and then there's the moral argument, right? So uh, I think that I, I think one thing to consider is business models are really something that you want to achieve at steady state. So don't assume that you can just introduce a business model and have all your value exchanges functioning the way you want day one. There may be things you want to do to prime the business model. Like if you're doing a two-sided marketplace, maybe you're going to offer stuff for free up front that you wouldn't later on, right? You might you might move towards a um, a charging approach. But I think I think on the moral side, like transparency is key here. So you're you know I think there's a reason Facebook is getting into so much trouble uh, with with boycotts happening right now. There's a there's a general feeling of uh, you know maybe not trans not transparency happening there. Um, so so I think. I think it actually helps to, to say, look, here's the value exchange, because what this allows you to do is design win-win models. I, I was actually, to take the ecosystem thing even further, like um, you can think some startups are going to act like invasive species in an ecosystem, right? Where you get some species that evolved in another place and then they come into this and they just kill everything, including themselves, right? It's like the kind of like the Napster, Napster model where they kind of, came in and destroyed the music industry and then they destroyed themselves. And then we, you know, we, this, this other ecosystem evolved on top of it. But so I think that um, the more transparency you have, the more you define win-win, the more successful you'll be in a sustainable way. Because if you help the value network thrive, you're going to help your business thrive. If you're too extractive, if you take too much value for yourself, then you may just kill the whole value network. Yeah, often what I say, some entrepreneurs are okay to earn millions uh, while they're killing billions, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Matt. I think, uh, yeah, uh, you already received some congratulation on, uh, okay. on, the, on the thing. And yes, uh, so I think we can find you at Mulesoft booth or, you know, talk about the different workshops. Yeah, uh, I've got a round table tomorrow and a, I'll be at the booth, Mike Amundsen, and I'll be at the booth tomorrow as well. So, but... Thank you, Mehdi, this great event and uh, looking forward to all the other sessions. Yeah, it's a great event because of great community and great speakers. So thank you, Matt. Uh, there, uh, yeah, you can disconnect your, your screen. I think it's done. And now we are receiving Mariuka Ninoya from uh, Osango. 
uh, who will talk uh, with us and who will talk about like uh, API economy updated, practical example with scientific research. So yeah, Marioka, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We hope it's not too late in Finland, but thank yeah, you. Yeah, I am sleepwalking here, so <laughs> sorry about that. It's middle of the night, but hey. <laughs> It's a, it's okay, you know. Uh, content yeah. never, ne never sleeps, right? So thank yeah. you for sharing with us uh, your your API economy, uh, um, let's say knowledge, which is made based on the book you, you wrote on the topic. So I let you on the stage, uh, and yes, enjoy the present. Thank you. So yeah, uh, API economy. So I was one of the co-authors of the API economy 101 book, and. Uh, what we did was that we wrote the basics there and, and we wrote it from a Finnish perspective, but also kind of a global perspective. And what we did was put some practical examples from, well, from 20 years of, of APIs uh, with scientific research, because that was the one thing that we didn't see uh, a lot done. So there were all these kind of industry reports and, and product uh, sale, sales materials, but no real research on APIs or popularized research. So my name is Marek Panina and I'm from Osama, as, as Mehdi just said. And one of the things I do is I'm local organizer of API Days Helsinki. We just did a June, kind of the first online API Days trial run, and it was well, uh, well received. So we're doing a, a bigger one in September. And I also train and consult a lot of companies and public sector organizations. And I can be called the mother of an API cycles method. That is a lean and open method for API development and, and specifically business oriented API development. So you can reach me with LinkedIn and Twitter and all kinds of other places. But here, uh, let's kind of continue where the previous speaker led us. So about the ecosystems and customer journeys. So I usually use this picture to kind of show uh, the point of where we should really start in looking at what is it that our company, our organization is actually uh, providing as APIs. So that's the one thing. You need to make a strategic choice as to what you're offering, what your customers, what your partnerships will be. Early on, I was working in a big retail company, and that was one of the things that we were kind of missing a direction because there was no partner strategy. There was some internal API development, internal digital development, but there was no partner stra uh, strategy. So we really didn't know who to partner with or who to provide our APIs. Well, we ended up doing a, a, an e-commerce solution for three countries, and we basically did this. Well, not the ordering which was at that time, it was a few years back, but we, we looked at who are we serving, who have already these APIs, these capabilities that we need, and where can we still buy, borrow, you know, build them. And the thing about ecosystems is that it's often misunderstood. So it's about kind of this uh, generating value together to the ecosystem and customers. And this is where I think there's a, there's a good research we quoted in the API Economic 101 book too, where there's a correlation between the global startup index and the emergence of APIs uh, globally. So there are areas like, you know, the Silicon Valley, Paris, London areas, which were already early on, both in the startup scene and in the API scene. And there's there are reasons for that, that were researched. For example, culture and marketers and developers together. So now this begs the question of what is API economy? If you're talking about it, we should define it. What we found out in, in the book, we originally wrote it in Finnish in 2018, and then it was translated in 2019. You can buy it in all kinds of Amazons and Googles and whatnot. So what we found out was that there was no you know, proper definition, one definition for API economy. So we had to make one up. And we uh, pondered on it and we came to these conclusions that, okay, utilizes resources efficiently. That's one important thing for a company. 
quick creation of added value uh, and you can use data and other resources provided by other organizations. So basically being quicker, being faster to adapt to changes and then understanding that there are these new customers. So there are these developers as previous speakers well addressed, but there's also this thing that actually we forget sometimes. I was, I was just working with the Finnish government on a kind of a travel related data hub project and we had to do legal design to make community guidelines for that platform. And we were told that there are only these developers that will use the APIs. I was like, well, maybe, is it really true? And then we found out that actually the developers developing the platform had already kind of made some other decisions because of the SPA technology that was used to build the whole thing, that actually every user was able to access the API and activate the API and connect it to whatever you know, Zapier or other platform or their website or something else. And that was a very good thing, but that was kind of a hidden uh, gem in the plans. So then what are the API economy business models? Well, there has been a lot of talk about th that already today, but I want to take another perspective to it. So actually what we should be talking about is that what are the specific industry business models? What are the specific technology business models and indirect and direct business models? And of course, there is also kind of what are the more operational centric uh, kind of focuses on, on business models and what are the kind of revenue centric or customer centric. But basically, there are a lot of misconceptions that I see in my line of work with, with customers um, that it's very easy to kind of go to a totally wrong direction. So you can go to kind of assumption that you need to build an API strategy while you actually need to build a business strategy that kind of includes APIs. So it's not just, you know, add water or just add APIs and then it's like an instant thing uh, or something. So it's really about enabling your business strategy with the use of APIs or even vice versa. And you need to take the APIs and related technologies and legislation and ecosystems and network effect and all that, you know, web 2.0, 3.0 business model stuff into account. And, and it's like, it's not guesswork. This is a very common thing that people are like, but what should we do? And, and is, is there like some magic answer that this is what exactly you need to do with APIs and business models? Well, of course there isn't, but there is a very good set of research now, which wasn't around at the time uh, fully when we started writing the book. So right now, when we are looking at the most recent research, there's a lot of stuff. So this was what we came up uh, at the time we originally wrote the book. So there are a few things here, like looking at not just API as a product, because yes, well, API is a product, but it can be so much more. It can be actually a feature of your kind of a tangible physical product. It can be a productized service or part of a productized service. It can be just a kind of an additional um, feature of your digital or real world service. For example, uh, you know, tracking your parcel or something like that. It can be a customer specific service and it can be just an interface to reach your uh, IoT or data or, or cognitive resources in a platform, for example. And it can, of course, be an interface to a platform, so multi-sided, two-sided, something else. So uh, in the research, we're calling them boundary resources. And then, of course, it can be a part of an integration. So call, calling an API as a product, so API as a product, kind of this thesis is correct in terms of treating APIs as a productized service or productized thing, but it's also wrong in the sense of it directs us too much in the idea that API is a lone standalone product always and cannot be anything else. And then there's of course this kind of API strategy 
misconception that uh, your strategic choices in your API strategy are just about who you provide APIs to. So kind of a positive thing and, and selecting from a multitude of segments, for example. But actually, it's a lot more about who you do not provide your APIs to. So actually, when you look at things, there are a lot of cases where a company is, is uh, thinking that, hey, we need to provide APIs. And they don't actually think about what are the capabilities of those possible potential consumers of those APIs. Can they actually consume an API per se, but, but can they actually, should they actually consume a plugin uh, to reach the API or a device to reach the API or something else? So when you really truly think about an ecosystem, you think also about all the operators, all the participants in the ecosystem and see that, okay, where do you actually need to plug your API in? And this has been a case in, in a lot of companies who, who I'm, I have worked with and also uh, somewhat in the research lately covered that how this kind of a, I would call it even a plugin ecosystem or kind of a different kind of an API consumership how that evolves. And here we see one example of a research which kind, kind of nicely summarizes this business models. So this is about IoT platform business models. And you can see a lot of different things. You can even see embedded device operation in the core capabilities there. And, and their whole idea of like embedding the features, embedding the APIs into some hardware, um, or a software running in a hardware, for example, that's an interesting concept. Or, you know, providing selected third party devices and provider devices and adding your API there as, a, as an additional feature. There are a lot of things here that we can take up. Uh, there's also a lot of revenue models um, in the bottom part there. So per connected device, per API called traffic based, all of the things that we actually see in a lot of different business models, not just IoT, they are very common API business models. But just to say that there are different kinds of areas based on the technology and, and based on the industry. I'll look at a little bit uh, further with more of them, but business model is not the same as revenue model. This is a common thing to, to kind of get wrong. So here's a business model canvas from an API cycles method. As I mentioned, I was developing it and it's a, an a open licensed method. You can just go to the URL there. And here's an example from a water services um, business model. I was working with the Finnish government and with the different water services providers in Finland. And we were trying to figure out what actually should be done by the water services providers themselves and what should be actually done with and by the ecosystem. So this was one area about water consumption API. And here you can see that the revenue streams are obviously one area of the business model, while there can be a lot of other things. So then the next one, uh, if I got a penny of all the uh, postgraduate or like graduate thesis workers who come to me and, and they say they are researching API monetization and they think that it's about money or like, you know, revenue. But actually, uh, Marco Seppanen, one of our co-authors of API Economy 101 uh, and professor at the Tampere University has researched this quite a lot and he just uh, delivered a great speak uh, uh, talk in API is Helsinki in June about API monetization. But the main thing is that you have all the, those indirect values. So a lot of public sector customers, for example, say that, no, we cannot use business models in our API strategy. It doesn't make sense because we are a public sector organization. But of course it makes sense. You have a lot of indirect value uh, for public sector organizations coming from from APIs, but also for like, I was working in a SaaS company and there uh, we got a lot of things like cost, more customer engagement, uh, less churn, more market share growth, you know, cost reduction, all kinds of things uh, that are indirect. So even if you don't charge for your API, uh, then you can still make or save money with it or create value. 
So then there's a lot of blockchain business models and blockchain for some people's surprise is of course connected with APIs and there's a lot of possibilities for API business models here. Uh, I'm, I was interested to see this particular research because actually what they have done is they have put APIs just in the kind of top corner here, which is kind of making sense, but one could argue that there could be other other purposes for APIs also. But there's again, a lot of similar things here and they even connect this to IoT than what we saw in the IoT um, business models. So, and, and by the way, these research uh, articles are, are quite openly available and I would suggest that you really look at them because no point in, in reviewing something that somebody al already has found not working or working. So API business models, they are not only about APIs, obviously that was already established by the other speakers. So there are all these technologies from IoT, blockchain, AI, ML, virtual reality data, and, and all of this stuff that uh, is kind of connected and has its own logics to um, the business models. But then if we took, take a few other examples, so energy sector, there's a lot of data hubs being built in European Union area because of a directive from European Union. And this has really been like smart metering and everything P2P uh, and all these aggregators have really uh, kind of given a, a, a push to developing a lot of interesting business models in this area. And this research uh, summarizes 40 uh, the most interesting companies and their business models. It's, it's really a good read. And they are looking at the value proposition, targeted customers, value creation, value delivery, and value capture and revenue model there. And it's so interesting because in energy sector, there's even this kind of prosumers and consumers and, and all that decentralization, which then translates to a lot of production areas and, and for example, um, kind of printed goods and, and uh, a lot of other decentralized um, processes. So then the question is how to start your API program and how to really pick the business model. So in the API economy book, I basically outlined the basic steps. And the thing is that you really need to include, as we also say in the API cycles method, that you need to really have the whole village, the whole company and the business stakeholders, the tech people, their purchasers, sale, salespeople, everybody, uh, and get them into the same table. This is the common mistake that happens, that every time somebody says, we failed or we don't know how to use, for example, the API cycles method, it's because they did not do this step, like do this seriously. And, and also don't create just an API program, create a business development program with an API focus and start with the strategic goals, but don't be afraid to change those strategic goals if they were kind of pre-API era goals. And map out the ecosystem journeys, customer and partner needs, and then start with really the customer needs first. Uh, then you will get to the right direction. So what tools to use? Well, you can use any business modeling or canvases, but of course they might only cover the typical business model possibilities and kind of guide you there. So this is an example from a research about uh, mobility as a service. And there were all kinds of uh, great business models mapped from Budapest and Greater Manchester and Luxembourg, Luxembourg and their uh, open APIs are, and standardized APIs are one area. We did this uh, work in Finland in the Finnish travel sector where uh, there was a law uh, which is not a European Union law but a, a national law about travel chains and, and APIing the whole travel sector and there uh, we kind of had to cover a lot of different uh, things about the business models of all these operators, uh, a real ecosystem story. But here then uh, Marco Seppanen and, and a research group again uh, has made this platform ecosystem canvas and we are actually uh, kind of formulating this platform model uh, with the Finnish travel data hub 
that is being built and we're doing the legal design on the community guidelines there. And it is really interesting because there are so many stakeholders and there is a freemium and free and all kinds of other models in the same platform. And when you start, you need to map out what are you? Are you a resource provider or a resource consumer? And remember that there are all these resources that you can potentially API fi With the method, uh, there's a whole set of canvases and, and instructions for all the different um, stages of API development. Uh, I'll show one example here from the water services. So here was the whole ecosystem and journeys mapped out. And then we kind of started to put, put stuff in here like I so showed you already before. So basically, if you want to read more about this, uh, I'm happy to help. We organize workshops, training, consulting, do all kinds of things around APIs. You can visit the apiscycles.com and you can go to train yourself at Osango Academy or uh, suggest to a friend or a colleague. And then there's some API scene blogs. Uh, so how to start an API program using API of cycles method. It also includes a full video from API Days Helsinki where I go a little bit deeper into the method and you can get the book online. So that's pretty much my stuff. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mariuka. Thank you very much for, uh, for this presentation. Uh, one question that sometimes uh, uh, occur um, about like the, what are called sometimes interface business models. Because yeah. sometimes people call EBI, API business models, they mix the service, mm -hmm. the capability, and the interface directly. Yeah. But some APIs are just like interface business models. The fact that you just either aggregate or you just uh, deliver it in a nicer interface, more support, mm -hmm. more maintained, right? So how do you defer the value of the data and the value of the interface that delivers the data, yeah. for example? Well, we actually just discussed this because of, for example, that travel data hub, uh, it's an interesting case. So first of all, travel companies, Finnish travel companies are, are inputting their data there. And then there's a whole ecosystem of service providers and government officials who are basically, uh, uh, and tourism organizations who are enriching and improving that data in all kinds of ways. There are APIs to translate the stuff there, are, you know, manual work and all that. But then there are these channels, channel operators, like, you know, trip advisors and, and Googles and other things. And they obviously are supposed to use that data via APIs. Uh, and then they are providing the data again to their customers, even with the APIs. So there's an issue with the kind of, when, when you deal with data, really like data uh, instead of just the API. So there is the problem or thing that a data can be transferred separately and stored separately from the API. So you have all kinds of ownership issues, you have editing issues, you have like, uh, for example, one thing that is making our heads ache is that you have one set of um, licensing inside the data hub, but when you actually take it out and you <laughs> publish it in a channel partner, uh, they might have their own conditions, but, uh, and then the data ownership even changes when it reaches that channel. So data is a wild card in a way compared to APIs. API is, is a much kind of more consistent thing on its own. So you always have to deal with the data issue separately. So the question is, if, API to, uh, if the API is easier to use than a file, for example, for data, does the API should be cheaper or more expensive because actually it's a better way to deliver the service. It is, it is. I mean, seriously, I have had to solve that problem too. <laughs> a long time ago, the first time, and, and we came to the conclusion that the API was going to be free for our like SaaS users, for example, because it just made so much sense. I mean, it reduced our cost of integration. So temporarily it resulted into cash flow loss basically, which was, you know, it sounded a bit stupid and it was a bit hard to sell to the management. But then uh, obviously when uh, things just got so much simpler uh, to do that integration, it was more customers that actually started integrating into the platform. And then there were even more customers coming in because we had the API and then they actually stayed longer 
uh, when they had built a lot of stuff, like some customers even built a whole new UI on top of the whole API, which we found out a little bit later, by the way, but they really stuck. They didn't go away. So yeah, I think it, it does make sense to offer the API more, more um, cheap or free than the file. Okay, so better service at lower price. Yeah, this is the API economy. Thank you very much, uh, Mariuka. And we will, we're going for 20 minutes of break so you can have uh, some rest, uh, visit the booth, uh, begin to network with this uh, chat roulette, uh, API is chat roulette uh, feature. And uh, we'll, we're back in 20 minutes for the next uh, uh, talks and sessions. See you in 20 minutes. <laughs>